Hello, everyone. My name is Julian, and today I'd like to talk with you about complexity, but in maybe a little bit different way than, than we are used to it. So I want to approach it from the modeling and design perspective of the software. Uh, and, okay, so let's start with a little exercise. And I might ask Stefan, can you please draw a car for me? And try to do it in like 30 seconds. While I'll go through one slide, which is, in case you fall asleep on this presentation or, or decide to, to walk out, just uh, this one thing. If you don't know any of these concepts, domain-driven design, test-driven development, solid principles, or functional programming, then stop coding, learn it, and then continue. How's that car? Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Stefan. So, we got a car here, and what can we say about this car? Like, for example, how many wheels does a car have? This, this tells me maybe two, maybe three, because there's one kind of uh, seen from the back. Uh, and, um, well, does it drive itself or do you have to push it? You don't know much about that, but it fulfills the task that was given to you, which is it gives us intuitive idea that this is a car, and that's what you've been asked for, so. <laughs> uh, now, so, so you can say it's a model of a car, right? In the specific context. Uh, and there can be a lot of different models of cars. And each of them uh, will make sense in a specific context. So this is a model of a uh, Corvette, really nice car. And it's pretty formal in terms of that if uh, that I could use this model, put it in some uh, software, uh, some uh, 3D design software, and and have a. Uh, three-dimensional model of this car. I could actually build a, a chassis of this car fairly accurate, given such a model. But, uh, and, and let's look at the other type of model. This one has a lot less details. And you can, you can think that the purpose of this particular model of a car is to give you the sense of dynamism and actually to iterate on designing some nice car. I would argue that uh, this particular model, as we see uh, it, it will never be built. Which brings us to, to the point whether this car is real or not, or should we even care about it? So the next time uh, anyone asks you to draw a car or perhaps design a system, uh, first ask for what purpose. So we have different models of reality. And you can ask w which model is actually the realist. Here you have an example of, of a model of two models that tell you something about the matter. One is elementary particles, uh, one which we probably, n not many of us learned in uh, high school. The other one is probably more familiar, which uh, is uh, the periodic table. Both of them describe the same uh, piece of reality, which is matter. And each of them works really well in a specific context. If you wanted to model chemical reactions with elementary particles, 
good luck. But on the other hand, uh, the, the atoms, the periodic table, do doesn't tell you much of uh, what is going on at, at subatom scale. Apart from the fact that you can tell uh, how many neutrons, electrons, and protons does an atom have. Uh, which brings me to, to, to the concept that, that we will be referring to throughout this presentation from, uh, I think that's the last book that Stephen Hawking wrote, uh, which is The Grand Design. And they defined a term out there called model-dependent realism. And they argued that reality should not be considered as itself, but rather interpreted based upon models. And if you have several models that describe the reality well, then you can say that multiple realities exist based on these models. And uh, that's why, uh, and especially in software, uh, reality is not that much that useful term, and models are. But now let's go back to the software, because this, this is too, a bit too theoretical, maybe. Uh, this guy, John Tucky, that's, uh, that's the first mention of the term software in history. At least that's what I found out. Well, he said that software is comprising of uh, routines, compilers, uh, blah, blah, blah. And, it is, and th those components are as important as uh, hardware of tubes, transistors, wires, and tapes. So this guy described two sets of items. And you can see that the fundamental difference between the two sets is, is the latter is has the physicality. You can touch a transistor, but you cannot touch a compiler. So the uh, question is, what driven the design of these abstract items, like compilers, routines, and the way they were designed? And that brings us to basically all the concepts that we deal with in software, be it monads, functions, objects, uh, threats. There is no physicality to them. They, they were modeled for us, software engineers, to do our job uh, more effectively, to hide certain details, certain complexities, in order for us to, to free our minds to uh, be able to reason about the business and not to have to think about zeros and ones. And uh, that brings me to the concept of abstraction, where, as uh, mentioned uh, in software, everything is basically abstract. So le let's see how languages evolved in time. Uh, you can imagine that at some point in, in human uh, history, uh, the, there, was a, there was some caveman who basically pointed at uh, some object and said, I don't know, bottle. There was no bottle, but fire, perhaps, or man, woman, spear. And this, what, this was what we would call a low-level language, uh, an assembly. On top of that, they started to develop, uh, they started to, to name groups of concepts. Like, for example, uh, a man, a woman, and a child, a family. Uh, a group of people running uh, after a mammoth with a spear, we call it hunting. Uh, and more terms like that, danger, and so on, that were very useful at those uh, ancient times, uh, and uh, they were key for survival because you could uh, you could basically shout out one syllable instead of ten, and warn somebody about a tiger, which could save their lives. Now, fast forward to modern times. What we see here, this guy is has probably like two minutes to describe a particular tactics that has to be uh, applied in the field. And 
if you heard, if you're not that hardcore football fan, and if you heard uh, what he's saying, although he would be speaking English, uh, you wouldn't understand a word that he's saying because he would be using all those jargon terms in, all, in order to save time and save the cognitive uh, load uh, from the players so they can understand it very quickly and apply the tactics almost intuitively. And, and there's like tons of names of, of, of the tactics and uh, every sport has uh, its own language. And you can call it domain-specific language. Now, you, you can already feel that language is built not only by one layer of abstraction, but tons of ab abstractions on top of one another. And just a, a quick demonstration of what uh, would it be if we didn't have those abstractions? So here we have a definition of peripheron, uh, which is defined in terms that we defined above. So we ha to, to define peripheron, we need the definition of an orbit, comet, asteroid, planet, and a star, more or less. Now, let's say we inlined all these definitions to define a peripheron. And uh, I'll try to read this definition and I'll see if any one of you understands it. So peripheron is a point in the elliptical path of a round celestial body which has removed debris and small objects from the area around its path. Small rocky celestial body or celestial object consisting of nucleus of ice and dust closest to a self-luminous gaseous spheroidal celestial body. That's how uh, programming in assembly would look like if we wanted to mm, develop a web application in it. Uh, and uh, one would say, is it really that abstract? Yeah, all terms that we use, uh, they don't have any uh, physical uh, representation. And they were developed for us by very smart computer scientists in order to do a better job. And this is what we did with it. So we kind of capped the abstraction level with uh, enormous complexity that is very hard to address, that, that is very hard to build anything more on top of that. So this will be a quick comparison of two different ways of representing a function uh, in software. And this one is more of, of a dynamic language um, flavor. So all we know from this representation is that you have some input parameter and some uh, output result. It doesn't tell you much does this function, can this function take a lot of time? Does it need a null check? Does it modify global state? Does it require global state? Uh, can it mutate the parameter? Can it throw an exception? There's no information here. So you, by using this model of a function, you basically move the cognitive load of thinking about those terms to the user of this method. Now, and this is not any specific language. I, I try to be agnostic of a language. If this looks similar to some particular programming language, then sorry for that. Uh, this is uh, another model, which tells us a little bit more about this function. It tells us that it does accept an input parameter. Apart from that, it accepts a context that we might think that this is the set of dependencies it requires. Uh, I've drawn a different arrow here to signify that we could have a special operator that actually tells us that there is no way that this function um, will have uh, side effects. And actually, there are experiments uh, with, with applying something like this. this I remember that uh, Scala has this uh, uh, idea of uh, stoic library. It's not in the language, it's just being research of an operator that uh, tells you that the function uh, 
th that allows you to control side effects of a function. Uh, wh when we see what it returns, we see the future, so we understand that this can take time, that we will have to wait for it, and it also, uh, the, the return type is wrapped in a try, so that also tells us that it can fail, and we are expected to check for failure. Uh, this is a nice uh, quote from uh, Understanding Software book, uh, highly recommend which uh, in essence tells us that a lot of complexity is born of the fact that we have not constrained our system well enough. And these two examples that you see, this is no constraints at all, this is heavily constrained model. And so, Introducing constraints is, the, is, is one of the key uh, factors in designing code and in designing systems. Um, now, going back to the complexity, uh, this is another book that um, I, I was reading when researching for this talk, and it talks about complexity in context of, that is different than software, uh, software in, in context of business, uh, life, evolution of life, uh, and society, so complexity of social interactions and so on. And that book made me realize that uh, one fundamental fact, that complexity is not something that you can fix. It's not something that you can fully control and you rather have to accept its existence and drive it and have a build particular models of it so that you can understand the concepts that are relevant for you. And uh, from this book, uh, I, I have this little uh, excerpt that will relate to the constraints part that I was talking to you. So can we overdo with constraints? That's the question. And they had this uh, one example when they were researching drugs um, to uh, basically f uh, stop uh, cancer from spreading or to cure the cancer, colloquially say. Um, and, and they were making mixtures of two or three drugs. Um, now, they uh, had two drugs that were very effective only during the cell division of a cancer, because when the, when the cancer cell divides, it, it kind of ex exposes uh, its internals and you can uh, break it easier. Um, so if, so those two drugs were very effective if you apply them with a third drug that promotes cancer cell division, which is, totally counterintuitive because who will cure cancer with, uh, with a drug that uh, speeds up uh, its uh, division rate. So let's say that in this experiment, if they constrained it to the point that you cannot use this particular third drug, you would never be able to, to come up with such an uh, effective mixture. And that brings us to the question, what abstractions have we, what languages have we pr uh, provided as software engineers to our clients, to our customers? So let's look at the most typical stack uh, there is, uh, which, um, which, which is maybe uh, used as a metaphor from uh, construction engineering and, and these lines between hardware, software, and business uh, might be kind of arbitrary at some point, at, le uh, at least between the business and the software. So let's focus on that. Let's, let's leave hardware for now. Um, the typical model is that the business provides uh, the specification of what has to be built and software and the engineers define how it should be built and they build it. But this is how it looks like uh, more often. 
So we have this, you know, uh, Chinese wall here over which we have to throw things like specifications and so on. And that uh, should make us question this boundary. If, if this is so troublesome, why do we even set it up? Why don't we just teach uh, business analysts coding? Or why don't we teach software engineers business skills? Um, and you can see that there's a spectrum in this model that goes from, from absolute order to absolute chaos, while this is something you can touch. Everything above it, you can't even touch it. Uh, but everything above the software level, you can't even formally prove it. So uh, another great book, which, uh, which gave me this uh, really useful metaphor of a screwdriver. Uh, and what does it mean that something is complex and something is simple? Uh, they had this uh, they, they had this assumption it's pretty true that there is no Turing effective procedure to list all the use cases of a screwdriver, which means that when someone invented a screwdriver and that must have been a very brilliant person by the way uh, they couldn't imagine what people will do with it that, that you can you know um, open a beer bottle, that you can open a, a paint can, that you can you know, uh, make uh, holes in some soft material, things like that, and you know, use, use it for uh, multiple different cases. And their, uh, their supposition was that if you have elements or systems that are complex, they become very specific for a particular task that uh, they were designed for. They might do it well, but they will never be adopted for anything else because they are so complex that they do only this one thing. While if you design systems or tools that are simple, then you open the possibility to adopt it to many different use cases, like a screwdriver. So let's, let's look at this uh, boundary, let's zoom in at this boundary between business and engineering and, and see what's going on there. Uh, we talk different languages, this is for sure. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you cannot expect a business analyst to read a technical blog and understand it nor can we understand the article about particular business domain that, that we never uh, dealt with. Some of these terms may overlap, but most of them don't. So how do we bridge this gap usually? Of course, we use specification. We, uh, we have you know, some formal ways like UML, like data schemas. We have metaphors like technical debt, uh, and in some cases we have domain-specific languages, which uh, I would argue are the screwdriver of software. But general flow of information looks like this. Engineers use metaphors in order to explain how system works, and business provides formal models, so the different ways that you can interpret what business wants is limited. So let's focus on the concept of complexity. I had this thought some time ago uh, because uh, that delivery speed of every uh, project I've been part of uh, always decreased with time. Uh, and this is due, due to the fact that complexity of a system always increases in time. So, and we have another metric in, in physical systems that always increases, which is an entropy. Uh, 
And then I found out that this was not very original thought. Uh, normal, Norman Augustine um, made up this point a long time ago. Now, can it, can it be useful? Can, is this something more than a metaphor? Can we formalize it somehow to measure the complexity or predict the growth of complexity of systems? Um, not really, because entropy assumes that all the components of the dynamic system are self-similar, and in software they obviously are not. Plus, what is even a fundamental component of software? Everyone will, will tell it, uh, will describe it differently. Uh, so let's look at the definition of complexity that is super formal. That is expressed by equation, which is McGabe's cyclomatic complexity. And they were, there were further refinements of this definition, that, but all of them based on this. So you have a graph of dependencies in your system, and uh, you have these three metrics, and you can calculate the cyclomatic complexity. Perfect. Super formal. Why don't we just scale it up at the system level, and we will have a definition of complexity. And uh, I was researching that a bit, and, and they, there were some white papers about that. But apparently, if you try to look from the business perspective, the complexity has more uh, of a, you would say, subjective component. And thus, this is, this is the part of this uh, of complexity that you you wouldn't be able to measure that easily by just looking at the description of a system which is the code and again cyclomatic complexity only indicates what is the complexity on the unit level uh, what about how these units collaborate should we assume this structure is perfect of course not it's far from perfect and and they there are good attempts of Mm, looking at the system as a graph itself, or, or even an ecosystem where you have different services or microservices talking to each other. And, and if you look at it as a graph, you can uh, develop tons of very useful metrics to define the complexity of your system. Uh, this is uh, one particular uh, take on that from Edmund Kirwan. Uh, the other one is from the tool called Structure 101, which analyzes the package, uh, package dependency graphs and, and tells you whether your project is healthy or not. Uh, hint, never create a package named helpers. And some folks even argued that you, if you visualize these graphs of dependencies uh, in, in a more human understandable form, uh, then you can use it to break out the monolith into microservices or into services. So you see in, in a circular representation of these uh, graph dependencies how, uh, how different parts of the system are coupled together and you can squeeze them into a single service. That's a strong indication that these should be together. Uh, now, so this is the con component structure analysis. This is what we call it. Uh, again, there's the same problem. You can, you can see the, uh, the kind of recursion here, that it only indicates the complexity at the system level. But what about how, how can we say whether the system expresses the business idea well? Should we assume this expression is perfect? Um, so let's look at the pyramid of wrong. What can go wrong? Uh, the code can be wrong, the specification can be wrong, and the idea can be wrong. And this is arranged in a form of pyramid for a particular purpose, because we as engineers tend to focus very much on one particular peak of this pyramid, which is wrong code. But the code can be right. If the specification is wrong, then we lost. And again, 
if you can go even further and, and say, well, the specification can be right, the code can be perfect, but the business idea can be wrong, and bam, we lost again. Then the question is, or uh, the, the observation is that we really focus a bit too much on how to you know, use tools to write code rather than how to be able to validate the business idea. How do we run unit tests for a business idea? Is that even possible? And this is, of course, this, this uh, eternal discussion between project managers and software engineers. Not really useful. You should probably try to help one another. Um, and there is an idea that is gaining a lot of attention. And uh, I like the way that it's been popularized by emergence of data science as a mainstream discipline, which is experimentation or how uh, uh, folks refer to it, testing in production. Um, so we have users, we, we have the population of our users, we can divide them into groups, we can test uh, a particular feature on one group and the, the lack of this feature on another group and validate if the outcome, if the user behavior, if the theory that we have about how the users will behave, uh, whether it's a feature that will actually drive a better acquisition or help users in a particular way. Uh, in, in case of uh, LandUp, uh, the company I worked on, the big question is uh, whether we, uh, by, by using a particular underwriting model, whether we can identify a group of applicants for credit card that are less risky than the other. Mm. And then we test it. And this whole process, of course, is iterative. So uh, we start with modeling of our domain. We, based off of that, we write a specification. From the specification, we design a system, but then so, so y you could say that this part, experimentation, for a long time was missing. But if you apply experimentation, you kind of go back into this cycle and you can re keep iterating on your system, designing it based on scientific uh, method where you can say something about your users and whether your theory about their uh, behavior is right or wrong. Yes, but we have not defined complexity. So let's, uh, let's have another take. What about this definition? A complex, uh, let's say we have a, a plane of solutions and somewhere on this area there is an ideal solution. So the complexity could be the distance between the current solution and the ideal one. That, so, so we would say the ideal solution has the complexity of zero. Um, it sounds nice, but uh, there's, uh, if we define it, we would say it's an Euclidean distance, a multidimensional system between current solution and ideal solution, where the ideal solution is unknown, because if we knew it, we would build it, and it's also always changing. Uh, so, how useful is that? Not really. Plus, there, the, there's this problem of uh, really infinite dimensionality of the solution space. Should we uh, take into cons consideration the cost of building that solution? Should we take into consideration the cost of transition from current solution to the ideal? Uh, and uh, should we have some business metrics around that? Nah, not really useful. Um, so, but, but we touched on something that I want to explore a little bit more, uh, which is that part of unknown perfect solution. And that, that uh, gave me uh, this idea 
If you folks play some strategy games, you will recognize uh, that concept here, which is fog of war, which is the kind of cloud beyond which you can only see the terrain, but you don't see the movement of units. So you don't see the dynamic part of the system, you only see the topology. And in a lot of cases, uh, our work is the same. Th there is a big fog of war where we can only, uh, where we know only uh, parts of characteristics of either the business idea or the system that we are dealing with. And, uh, and we cannot assume anything beyond that. We cannot assume any uh, dynamic behavior about that. So, so it's like you have two types of systems. One that are simple, that you can formally prove, uh, that you know everything about uh, them, like a clockwork, and the other one is complex, the one that you can only reason about, let's say, stochastically, so by applying some statistics. Uh, and that brings me to, 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 to this nice uh, depiction of how applying different models can simplify uh, the work or can simplify the description of a system. So this is this is a model of a gas with all the uh, particles uh, bumping from each other and from the walls of the box. And if you were to um, figure out certain metrics about this system, like for example, its, its temperature, and if you were to apply just like the uh, principles of movements of movement and energy you would have to model every single movement of every single particle and maybe do some event based simulation to see how the gas as a whole will uh, behave then good luck with that but fortunately we have the equations from thermodynamics and we can do it fairly easily by not considering the gas as uh, as a set of particles at all, but as, as a substance that has a few well-defined uh, metrics like temperature or pressure. And this is an example of where a model that hides certain details about the system can simplify reasoning about this system greatly. Um, so we're nearing the end, and I want to uh, I, I want to try to convey the message that that you would take home with you, uh, which is that it is not the reality of software; it is not the way that systems are that is complex. It is the way that we speak about them, that we choose to speak about them, and we, with every line of code we write or with every line of code we decide not to write, we are developing a language for the consumers to use. And we have the ability to make this language simple or not. Uh, but wha what's in it for us? Uh, so this, this comes from my big skepticism about tools and frameworks. And I think the industry is growing towards uh, this attitude because people get burned too much on frameworks over and over again and, and start realizing that there is no golden hammer, there is no ultimate framework that will help us uh, simplify uh, our system, that we actually have to do it ourselves. So let's have this approach too. Let's not build frameworks for our customers or le le let's not build uh, super complex systems for our customers that, that, that they can only do one thing right. Let's give them some power and, uh, and see them solve their problems by themselves. Uh, one, and I think the most, 
successful example of, of, of such an approach in software, uh, I would argue is uh, emergence of sequential query language. Uh, SQL has existed for, I don't know, 30 years right now. And it's, it's one of these um, tools that actually uh, totally denies the hype cycle. SQL is always there. There's no, uh, th there's no overinflated expectations about SQL. There's no uh, hate on SQL, although there was some period where the, the no SQL movement was, was very, um, uh, very prevalent and a lot of people probably switched to MongoDB and now they are uh, regretting that. Um, so you, and I'll go back to this idea of a screwdriver where SQL is the screwdriver of software where when these people developed this language, they had no idea what broad spectrum of application it will have. That we will be building SQL abstractions on top of different, uh, different systems, just in order for people to understand data that they express better. So, so you have this, you know, uh, clones of it, like for example, Jira software, I don't know if you use that, has uh, JQL uh, and, and a lot of other tools have uh, the same uh, expression of their concept in an SQL-like language. Uh, one emerging trend that I really like is the Facebook's GraphQL, which, uh, which is a way to describe API in a similar way, and I feel like it might be the next screwdriver. But bottom line, complexity is not something you remove. You can only direct its growth and maybe slow it down a little bit. And you do it by creating models. Models are nothing but domain specific languages and a language is nothing more than a hierarchy of abstractions. We as engineers whether we want it or not, we are developing languages. So let's do it consciously. Let's not develop languages that ho only have one verb uh, that the users uh, can apply for a certain functionality. Let's give them more power and let's do it uh, with conscience. With that, I'd like to thank you all for attendance and go home and write a DSL, see how it goes. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, I'll welcome them now. Uh, if not, then thank you very much.